Well, Peter, thanks. And <clears throat> yeah, I want to be modest, but you know, I want to brag on my team. And I want to brag about Ohio State because it's an honor to be here. I've learned a lot tonight, and I hope you have so far. And I hope the learning's not over. <clears throat> I want to tell you a few stories here that kind of set the stage of w the way we've been able to grow and the things that we continue to do to help serve our patients with advanced organ failure. So I'm a surgeon. So if you have, I'm going to go through a couple of scenarios here. If you have a problem with your gallbladder, you go to the surgeon and they schedule you for surgery and take your gallbladder out with those cool instruments. Um, I recently injured my knee skiing um, and went to the orthopedic surgeon and with those cool instruments they fixed my knee. I'm still doing pretty well. Um, but I was able to get that done without any kind of problems with access and limit limitations. Some people have heart disease and may need to have heart surgery. And they go to see the heart surgeon and they may need a bypass or a valve replacement and usually that can be done safely and without any limitations. Now, some patients have advanced organ failure and here kidney failure. They may need dialysis because the kidneys don't work and so they have to be hooked up to a machine. So they come in to see us and they need a kidney transplant. But they don't come with a kidney. So unlike the other scenarios, you need your knee fixed or whatnot. You can go, but you don't bring the instruments to the doctor. They already have them. We don't have the kidneys. So we're really uh, at the mercy of um, organ donation and living and cadaveric donation. So I want to tell you a few of the things that we do to help expand the donor pool. You may or may not realize what this uh, represents, but I hope you do, <laughs> since everybody here is a Buckeye. If, if you don't, this is the horseshoe. And um, I am a Buckeye now, but I'm new to Ohio State in a relative sense. But I wanted to show you that the need is great. There's approximately 125,000 people on the organ transplant waiting list for all organs. That's more than fits in the Ohio Stadium, which seats about 105,000 when I looked recently. So that's a lot of people waiting for a transplant. Most of those need a kidney, but there's a sizable number that need a liver, and then we go through heart and lung and, and uh, pancreas as well. But really the thing that I wanted to impress upon you is about 8,000 people die a year waiting for an organ transplant. <clears throat> we have the power we have the ability to affect that. And that's one of the things that I wanted to really impress upon you as we go through this. This shows you over a 25 year period, you can see in the purple bar, the number of people that have been put on the waiting list annually, and you can see it's up to 120 some thousand. Now this starts in 1993, an organ transplant's been going on prior to that, but uh, I started in this field about that time, so um, I've been doing this for, for close to 25 years. But you can also see at the bottom there that there's uh, about 30,000 transplants that are performed a year, about 1,500, what we call, uh, 15,000 cadaveric donors, and then the remainder of those are living donors. So one of the premises upon which we can do um, organ transplant is one, we need the organ, but also we have to be able to match the blood types. And you may or may not be familiar a little bit, and I just want to quickly show you this. An O donor is the universal donor. So they can donate to anybody. But if you're an A, you can only donate to an A or an AB, and a B to a B or an AB. And if you're an AB, you can only donate to an AB patient. However, if you're a recipient, you can see it's just the opposite. So those are important things because we can't really modulate that no matter what we do to change that. So let's take, um, we're going to talk about living kidney donation. We, most of us have two kidneys. Um, and I think that gives us the opportunity to give one away. And so actually that happens. We do living kidney donation. Um, and that's a really unbelievable thing. I'm, I've been doing this a long time and whenever, when I do this, it's just remarkable what people are willing to do for each other. So Mrs. Jones, who's married to Mr. Jones, you can see that their blood types are not compatible. Likewise, Mrs. Smith, who's married to Mr. Smith, don't have compatible blood types either. But we know that A's can go to a, a and B can go to a B. So therefore, those two, uh, Mrs. Smith can donate to Mr. Jones and Mrs. Jones to Mr. Smith, and they probably don't know each other, but they could do it, and therefore they can both get transplanted. So this is a swap. 
Um, now, this has been going on in the United States for probably 10 to 12 or 13 years. We've been doing this. So it's living unrelated. It was historically, it's always been between related uh, family members, spouses, children. Um, now this is unrelated, and they don't even know each other. Now, you can take this a step further, and we take somebody as we call a non-directed donor. So the power of the American community, people want to help each other. Sometimes we get what we call altruistic donors, or, or there could be a non-altruistic donor, and they want to donate to somebody. <clears throat> we can then create chains when we have a number of incompatible people and line them up based on their ABO incompatibility and create multiple chains of people who can get transplanted. This is really powerful, and it's a way that we can advance the number of patients who have the opportunity to get off dialysis, which is really not a good uh, way for them to live. And actually, it's been shown very clearly that organ, a kidney transplant uh, extends life far more than dialysis does. So our goal really is to get patients off. Uh, I need to go back. Uh, our, our goal is to get patients off dialysis. And um, I, I wanted to show you this video because it's really pretty cool. Melanie is John's wife. Melanie donated to Bill. Cullen is the boyfriend of Bill's daughter. Cullen donated to Matthew. Cheryl is Matthew's mother. Cheryl donated to Patricia. Lisa is Patricia's sister. Lisa donated to Beth. Anne is a friend of Beth's daughter. Anne donated to John. So we did a five-way kidney exchange on Valentine's Day a few months ago. And this is all 10 of those patients, donors and recipients. We did it all in one day. We had four operating rooms going, uh, multiple surgical teams. All the patients are doing fabulous. This was at a recent reunion we had last month for Organ Awareness Month. It just shows the power of what we can do when we're at a major medical center that has the resources and the institutional commitment to really push the envelope and really trying to provide the, the highest level of patient care for us. This requires an enormous amount of effort and resources. And, I, and I'm just proud to be a part of this. It, it was published in the paper and actually got a lot of national press. It's not the largest that's been done. It's the, lar one of the, lar it's the largest that's been done in one day at Ohio State and one of the largest in the country. We have a four-way coming up in a couple weeks. So I, I just, I mean, it's like really proud to be part of this team. I, I have a very small part to play, but it's really something that is really cool. Change gears just a little bit. We'll talk about the liver. So this is Greek mythology. This is <clears throat> Prometheus who gave fire to the humans, really antagonized Zeus. Zeus sent a raven, it chained him to a rock and then sent a raven down to eat his liver every day. But he ate it every day because it kept growing back. And it's true, the liver grows back. So like the only other organ in the body, which is the skin, if you cut yourself, it grows back. A healthy liver will grow back. Gives us remarkable abilities to do some very cool stuff with the liver to help other patients. So we can actually take a portion of an adult liver, it's usually a half, and put it into another adult. This is a formidable procedure. We can do it and take it from a parent to a child as well. It's been going on for a long time. So this is another opportunity. We're going to be starting this in July. I've had quite a bit of experience doing this at my prior institution, and one of my other junior colleagues has had that experience as well. So this is another way for us to expand the organ donor potentials for our patients with advanced organ failure. And lastly, I just wanted to, to go through a few things here with you and show that um, organs that uh, pa families consent to donation aren't always organs that are acceptable for transplant in their current state. So this is actually a picture of human lungs that uh, sometimes are not acceptable for transplantation because they're full of water uh, from the, the process of, of, of the uh, donor uh, dying. Um, they, but they can be taken out and potentially rehabilitated. So we have, uh, we're participating at Ohio State, one of a few centers in this what we call ex vivo, where they take the lungs out, put them on a perfusion machine, where actually they ventilate the lungs. Uh, this did one uh, over the weekend. 
Um, and it's really pretty cool. And then they can rehabilitate the lungs over a short period of time, a couple hours. And if they're deemed re reasonably for transplant, then they're transplanted. And so we've done that successfully seven or eight times now um, with our cardiothoracic transplant surgeons. We've been using this uh, similar mechanism for kidney transplantation. You can't see the kidney, but it's in the middle there for many, many years. And Ohio State's been one of the leaders in that. And we use that not only to re rehabilitate the kidney, but also we use it as a diagnostic tool to give us an indication if the kidney will function well after transplant. And lastly, uh, we're hoping very soon to be a part of uh, this trial, which is uh, liver perfusion, which is a very exciting thing. Um, we're not yet in the trial, but we really hope to as our liver program has uh, dramatically improved or increased in volume over the, over the last year. So we have uh, what we call an organ assessment and repair center. It's actually a dedicated space that the institution created for the, the uh, comprehensive transplant center. We have these perfusion devices actually in the room. We also have basic science labs that are looking at uh, the molecular biology behind some of the organ injury and repair issues. So that's just some of the cool things that we're doing at Ohio State uh, that uh, help our patients with advanced organ failure. And why did I come to Ohio State recently in the last uh, 16 months or so? It's because of the great opportunities that existed here, the great people, and really the ability to help move the field forward with the support of a wonderful institution. So I'm really proud to call myself a Buckeye. Um, I am not a Buckeye by birth, but I'm a Buckeye now. Um, I wanted to show you this and leave you with this picture, which is uh, these are pinwheels that are planted in the month of April. We have a very, uh, a very big ceremony. It's Organ Donor Awareness Month. There's 8,500 pinwheels. And we have uh, families and, and recipients that come <coughs> for a ceremony, and we plant these in front of the hospital. 8,500 rep represents an organ transplant, every organ transplant that's performed at Ohio State since the inception of our program. Um, there's eight eight spokes on the pinwheel, which represents um, all eight organs that can be transplanted. And uh, you know, with everybody's help, and I consider everybody that here in the community, we intend to plant hundreds and thousands more to help our patients in need. So thank you very much for your attention, and it's been a pleasure to be here with you.